So let's have a look now at how linked state routing works uh, in comparison to distance vector routing. Uh, so in, in one sense, it's a little bit similar. So all the nodes uh, will send information about uh, you know, what their view of uh, connectivity is. But now, instead of just sending them to neighbors, we actually send them to every node in the network. But we only send information about the direct connections that each node has. So this goes out in a link state packet. Um, so the link state packet has to have the ID of the node that created it so that we can tell who is who. Um, and it includes cost information about all of the directly connected neighbors so that, uh, again, we get to discover that bit of topology of the network around that node. Uh, it has a sequence number, so this can be updated over time uh, as things change. Uh, and it has time to live information for the packet, again, so that we don't have uh, infinite uh, looping going on. And it uses a reliable flooding algorithm uh, to propagate this information to every node on the network. Uh, so each node stores the most recent LSP that it's received from each node, uh, and it forwards each new LSP that it receives from a node to every other node except the one that sent it. Uh, and periodically it will update uh, the LSP, although conceptually it only needs to update it when information changes. Uh, and so this can be, uh, it has a, a lower quiescence or a lower uh, you know, idle state uh, bandwidth consumption than a distance vector algorithm typically will. And every time it updates the LSP, it has to increment the sequence number so that the other nodes can tell. And so we start at zero uh, when we, we boot up, and this will just increase monotonically as we go through. Uh, and we decrement the, the TTL of each stored uh, LSP. Uh, Again, so that we don't have loops of this you know, buzzing around in the network for much longer than it, it should. So when the TTL reaches zero, the time to live, uh, then we, we ditch that packet. So the reliable flooding algorithm uh, is really quite simple. So when a node, as we said, when a node receives an LSP, it sends it to every directly connected neighbor except for the one who sent it. So it won't send it to wherever it came in from. Uh, so you know, if X receives it, it'll send it to A and C. A and C won't send it back to X because they received it from X. They will send it on to B. B's actually got it twice. That's fine. But B knows it got it from A and C. So B doesn't need to send it back to A and C. It only needs to send it on to D. And so at the end, uh, we actually have you know, every node has received it. And we've been reasonably efficient in the flooding. Of course, if A and C magically knew that they were both connected to B, then only one would need to send it. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is, uh, you know, it's a, that's a fine level optimization. Uh, and the, the overall reliable flooding works quite well to, uh, to get reasonable efficiency in practice. So once each node then has all of these little pictures of the pieces of the topology, it needs to integrate that uh, to be able to generate the routing table. And so Dijkstra's algorithm is used for this. Uh, and so it does make an important assumption that you can't have negative uh, costs on any of the edges. Um, and this is probably not a problem in most cases. It's a little bit hard to imagine where you would have a negative cost uh, on a network link, um, whether that would mean somehow that it was faster than the speed of light if you were comparing speed, like faster than infinity, um, or where someone was paying you to transfer data over a link. Um, in which case it wouldn't affect your routing decisions anyway, I suspect, because you would just fill that link with as much traffic as you could. So this is in general, not a, a major problem. So let's have a look at how this algorithm would work uh, in practice. So um, if N is the set of nodes in the graph, um, so we might have nodes, you know, one, two, three, four, and five, that's fine. So N is that set of five nodes. Uh, and then if um, I, um, I comma J, is that cost associated with the edge between the nodes i and j. So i1, comma 2 uh, would be set to some value that is the cost between nodes 1 and 2. Uh, and so this, there is an edge cost for every combination uh, of i and j. Um, and those where there's no direct connection, that cost will be infinity. So again, this is a little bit uh, similar uh, to what we saw with the, um, the distance vector routing. So if there's no direct edge, the cost is infinity. Uh, so let S um, be the starting node, which starts executing the algorithm. Of course, every node will actually be doing this uh, itself. 
So the algorithm only needs to keep track of two key things. One is a set of nodes that have already been covered by the algorithm. And uh, CN is the cost of the path from itself to each node uh, in the algorithm. So we start out by saying that the, uh, the set of nodes already visited is only the node which is doing it itself. So M is equal to uh, the set containing only S. So if node one was doing this, that would just be M is equal to only node one. Uh, then for each uh, node in the complete set of nodes except for itself, so this is what this N minus uh, S means. So every node other than itself, um, we say that the cost to get to that node uh, is equal to, oh sorry, and that's L not I, it's a lowercase L. This is a, an annoying font for that, isn't it? Um, so it's L uh, S comma N. So we're saying the cost from ourselves to get to that node is what we're going to say the cost to that node is. So this is saying initially the cost to every node um, is the cost that we already know to get to that node. So lots of these will be infinity to begin with, right? Uh, unless the node that is doing it happens to be connected, directly connected to every other node. Then we continue through until the set of nodes that have been visited is the entire set of nodes. So then we then uh, say that we want to add to the set of visited nodes some node W, uh, where that is the node which has the lowest listed cost. So again, it can't be itself. So it will look at the, the node that has the lowest cost that it's directly connected to in the first instance. And this makes sense if you think about it. So if you want to find the lowest cost to get somewhere, you want to look at the lowest costs that you already know on the network and look to see if you can get further out those without that cost exceeding some other cost on the network. Uh, so then for all of the other uh, nodes on the network, we update the cost to get to that node to be the minimum of what we already knew to be the cost, which initially might be infinity um, or the direct link cost. And we add to that the cost to get to that node that we're looking at, um, plus the cost of that node to get to the node that we want to get to. So we're basically saying we take the minimum of the cost we already know to get to a node and the minimum cost that we can compute for some other node to get to that node. Uh, and so this will exhaustively, if we did this in every possible combination, that would exhaustively get us the optimal route, uh, route to get to, um, uh, to every node. But by doing this only for the minimum cost node in each iteration, uh, we can actually save a lot of time and not have to do every possible combination because we're effectively doing a um, uh, a breadth first search based on lowest cost and stopping as soon as we've found what it can provably be, uh, provably must be in fact, the cheapest cost to get to each node. And I'll stop there because I suspect you probably need to go back and listen to that uh, algorithm more than once.